Good morning, everybody. I invite you to enter into this sacred space with me by consciously breathing, There's an aspect of the mind called the witness. And when we take up residence within the witness self, we begin to witness first our breath, that life-giving thing that is offering us with every moment the breath. How simple is that? And so we start by attending to the breath, observing the inhalation, however shallow or however deep. And then the surrendering with the exhalation. Ah. Established in this observer self, we observe what is arising within our being in this time together. Perhaps there are thought patterns that are arising. And as we consciously breathe, we can observe those thought patterns. And if we don't put our attention on them, if we don't engage in them, they will just by their very nature move through the sky of mind like a cloud would. And then we are established once again in that vast, spacious, infinite mind out of which thought may arise. And we don't resist the thought. We just observe it. Nor do we follow the thought. And if we should follow the thought and get interested in what we're pondering, then with just a simple exhalation, we can say enough. I'm done. And return to the breath. Return to that inner peace that inner silence that's always there. I have discovered in life the more silent I can become, the deeper I can go in my meditation. Because by its very nature, meditation is to establish in us a quiet mind and an open heart and they work together simultaneously. So they're not separate. And the only effort, if you would call it an effort, that we do is to just attend to the breath. Bringing our attention back to this breath, this benign, loving breath. And notice the consequence of just attending to that. During these troubled times on our planet, one of the skills that we can master is the ability to be peaceful, the ability to respond and not react, the ability to witness who we are in every unfolding moment. I hear the voice of Paul the Apostle who spoke about living prayerfully in this world and he had three simple suggestions. The first is to not worry. Worry is faith in a limited idea. Now a worried emotion might arise but we don't have to follow it. The second thing he said is in your asking do it with a grateful heart. Uh, recognizing that it's already there, the things that we're seeking. If we're asking for love, notice that it perhaps is the love within that's asking. 
to see itself reflected in other, ultimately realizing there is no other. And the final most profound thing Paul suggested was to recognize that peace that is always there, that goes beyond thought, beyond understanding, and he said, let that guard your thoughts and guard your heart. And so we return to peace again. And this simple practice can assist us in assuming the consciousness that is required as we journey through life. This Sunday, we're going to explore the idea of resting in the journey, uh, the journey of the soul, that jubilant and beholden soul that is our eternal nature. And as we move out of the identity of being the star of our movie, which is the ego's way of living, we realize that we are a player in the divine drama of life itself. That we are a wave on the ocean of love. And as that wave, we are filled with this oceanic presence. All of us, no greater, no lesser, equal. And we are sustained by this breath, by this Holy Spirit, that we all are an aspect of. So I hear the wisdom of Richard Rohr, the Franciscan monk, who says, until we know our own trinity of being, not as some abstract mental concept, but as the verity of all life, knowing that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are that transcendent presence moving through all form, through the energy of this spiritual energy that we all share. All operating simultaneously. So instead of an ego with an agenda, we're spiritual beings, all of us, all life, and we happen to be having a human experience. But all of life is sentient, all of life is sacred, all of life reflects this trinity of being. That brings us into an intimacy with life all life, and we see it reflected everywhere, our own self, mirrored through this beautiful creative universe. And the only thing that is shifting is our perception. Instead of perceiving ourselves as separate and apart, we begin to perceive ourselves as interconnected and one. There is an intimacy of belonging to the universe then. And you hear Jesus saying, if I've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Because it's all the one, it's all the presence. And we rest in that knowing. We rest in the unfolding and the flow of who and what we are. So I would invite you to access this soul of your being who never went anywhere, who's still there. And you can tell that you have arrived in the soul consciousness because the soul seeks meaning, whereas the ego wants answers. And so if you can find meaning in your heart of hearts for the life that you've been given and for the karma that you awoke to, knowing that your karma is your dharma, your karma is your spiritual practice. So my karma is to be a minister, a spiritual director of sorts. And that is my dharma, that is my spiritual practice. To be ever aligning to the beginner's mind, to the awakened heart, and to the breath. It's simple, and yet it's very profound. So I invite you to be here now 
and put your hands over your heart chakra. And I invite you to listen with your heart today to something that you already know that awakens when we get out of the way and we stop analyzing and we move into that part of us called Gnosis. The Gnostics spoke of it. A deep knowing that is there beyond reason, beyond thought, beyond concept, beyond belief. The Hindus call it Sat Chitananda. Sat meaning truth, a truth that unveils itself. Chit meaning consciousness, a consciousness that we all share. And Ananda is bliss, a sense of harmony all operating in us when head and heart come together as one. So if you would like to open your eyes now, keep your masks on. You all look so beautiful. I saw a store the other day, Trey and I were walking the dogs downtown, and there was a florist shop, I think it's Bishop's Flowers, and in the window it says, we love to see your beautiful smile when you come through our doors wearing a mask. And so I found myself chuckling. If we can chuckle even through wearing a mask, I only take mine off in order to do this so that you can um, perhaps hear me better so I'm not mumbling behind a mask. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. This month I'm speaking, this is the 30th of August, and this month I'm talking about living in the flow, the flow of life. And I found in my office this morning a lovely little book by Eric Butterworth called In the Flow of Life. And Eric Butterworth was a, a famous unity minister who had an enormous church in Manhattan. I think he spoke at Carnegie Hall. And, uh, and I pulled out this little book this morning because he talked about living in the flow in a very sweet sort of way. A picture of young David Leonard. Anyway, he starts off by Patanjali, who wrote Patanjali. Uh, he's a the Yoga Sutras. And Patanjali said, as the removal of earth by a farmer digging a ditch opens up a channel for water to flow to his crops, so the removal of obstacles by the student opens up the channel of cosmic energy to flow into his being. So what he's saying is remove the obstacles to the flow. What's blocking this flow of love? What's blocking this flow of awareness? Oftentimes it's a belief, it's an emotion, it's a long-held attitude. You know that you stomp your foot, you fold your arms, and have to stay away from my belief because I know I'm right. Until you realize, maybe I'm not right. Maybe I don't have all the answers. Maybe I don't know. And then in that I don't know place, something happens called possibility. I was reading John O'Donohue, and he said, you know, the ego wants to have all the answers, but when you live in the soul, the soul loves contradiction. Well, maybe it isn't the way I thought. Maybe it is by being vulnerable that I become strong. And so when you can move into contradiction, not have all the answers, then, John O'Donohue says, the divine imagination can awaken and possibility can approach you. Maybe it's possible to see my parents in a different light. Maybe my karma is to use my spiritual practice to overcome the obstacle of me. Could I be the only obstacle I have in my life? I wonder. Could you be the only obstacle? Now that's a very lovely thing, because when you can recognize the part of you that's blocked, then you can lovingly say to yourself, I don't need that anymore. I'm willing to let that go. I'm not going to defy the world and stand in my opinion. Sometimes opinions are like, you know what, so everybody has one. I'm not going to say what they're like. So Solomon said, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. What are you thinking in your heart? I like to think that what's happening on our planet is the wake-up call for the heart of humanity. I really truly believe that this Black Lives Matter movement is going to lead to great social justice and reform. I have to believe that. I can't believe that it's going to awaken hate and fear in our country. So what if we could see the possibility that some good is going to arise out of this? Truly, he said, um, it either places us consciously in a universal flow or it frustrates the flow. Huh. Do you want to be in a universal flow? where I'm accessing the love of the universe, the wisdom of the universe, the peace of the universe, the joy of the universe, the creativity of the universe. The universe has a sense of humor. And when you can goof on stuff, you set yourself free. If you take it too seriously, you're stuck in your seriosity. So he goes on to say, Eric Butterworth, in the same sense, if we think health or abundance, we do not create these things. There is no way that man can create health, 
Rather, it is a flow, or rather, it is a flowering of our own divine life. Huh. So what if when we do our revealing services, it's not, Ernest Holmes says, there's really nothing to heal. There's only the wholeness to be revealed. Underneath the appearance of dis-ease and discord, there is an innate wholeness that wants to flower, that wants to flow. You know, I, I shared with you last week that I worked with a, uh, a Qigong master, and I was asking her about the pain in my back that I'd been dealing with, and she said in her beautiful Asian, she speaks Chinglish, half Chinese, half English, and it was so cute. She says, uh, in China, if you focus on the wholeness of your spine, you are bringing that into your reality instead of focusing on the pain in your back. I said, well, thank you so much. And he's saying the same thing. So he says, when the mind is stayed on the God thought of our own innate wholeness, we are synchronistic with our own flow of life. And when we think about abundance, we are synchronized with the flow of abundance. We do not create it, nor do we start or stop this flow. We simply accept it giving it our consent as our own natural flow. So wealth is the law of my life, and I am wealthy in everything. I'm wealthy in smiles. I'm wealthy in love. I'm wealthy in, in flowers. Somebody showed up and brought me flowers today, you know? I'm wealthy in puppy dog kisses and kitty cat purrs. And we simply accept it, giving our consent to the natural flow of the givingness of the universe. And that is what the presence, presence of God really is. It's the life of God present in us and as us in an inexorable flow. I don't know what the word inexorable means, but it sounds good to me. And he says, and this is what prayer really is. It's the kind of thought that's synchronized with our natural flow, for it's simply our consent that's required. Our way of saying yes to this flow of the universe, which is the Father's good pleasure in all of us. He loves to quote scriptures. The Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom is already here. It's this flow of well-being. It's this flow of love. It's this flow of soulful creativity, the Satchitananda. You know, the truth awakens in us. I love that the truth unhides itself. It hides itself through consciousness. We realize that we're more than we thought we were. I was listening to Richard Warren. He talked about when he was a six-year-old boy standing in front of the Christmas tree in Kansas. And he says, all of a sudden, at age six, I realized I was one with the universe. And he said, I, who do you say that to? I, he was from a very conservative Catholic family. And he says, I don't think they would understand it. So I kept that sense of oneness to myself. But he said, it led me at age 14 to join the monastery, to become a Franciscan monk. And he said, my greatest disappointment was when I joined the monastery, all the other young men were more into it to wear the robe and to have the power of the priest, rather than to be in love with the oneness and the wholeness. So he said, I still kept that sense of oneness and wholeness to myself. Well, could we come out of the closet? and recognize that we are connected to one another. I was sharing at the Revealing Service, Trey and I were in Mento, we took a little retreat from the world and rented this house in the middle of a forest, and all of a sudden there appeared a butterfly, and it was flying around Trey's face, and then it was flying around Bert's, my old dog's head. And of course, being the crazy person, I said, that's baby speck. And Trey said, that's a butterfly. I said, well, why would the butterfly be interested in you and Bert and not interested in the flowers in the flower bed. And she kept flying around his face. I said, I think, because I was thinking about her all morning, I said, I think she just came to let us know that she's here. I know I sound crazy, but that's my, my flow consciousness. So lastly, Jesus said, in a world, in the world, you have tribulation. He says, but I, I have overcome the world. In other words, I'm not living in reaction to the stuff that goes on on the outside. I've overcome that. I don't let that... I don't let the storm on the outside become the storm on the inside. And this is something each of us has to cultivate in our own unique way. You know, Adam has on his arm a little tattoo that just says, let it be. It is what it is. There's suffering on the planet. And when we have equanimity and we don't see that suffering as bad, we had a tornado down there. And I was so concerned about Al's relatives because I know they live down in that area. And then I noticed that the tornado moved across and went to Eva. We have some congregation members that live in Eva. And I called them, and they're okay. It's normal to have concerns and fear. And he said, uh, but to overcome the world. I have overcome the world. We so easily get out of the consciousness of the flow of spirit. Someone cuts in front of our car on the freeway, and then we get angry, and we're out of the flow. Huh. So just to recognize that we're in, we're in a flow, and it's a flow called life. And it was Einstein that says there are two kinds of people. Those that recognize that everything is in divine order and those that don't. 
You know, and if we know that, as he also said, God doesn't play craps, there is an order in the universe, there is a natural flow, and it operates through consciousness. And when we align ourselves with a more skillful way of perceiving things, like this isn't a bad thing that happened to me, I don't have to be a victim of it, perhaps it's my karma waiting for my dharma. You know, it's my karma to be cut off so that I could have the dharma say, maybe he's in a rush and he needs to go faster. Then I'm not reacting and giving my power to him, but rather I'm operating in a flow of non-reaction, a flow of non-expectation, a flow of abiding acceptance. It's because when we don't accept, when we attach, when we project, when we expect, that we suffer. And it's just a simple little practice. You know, there's a wonder, I love it when truth gets real simple. I love Adam's talk at our candlelight service about simplicity. And one of the simplest things I heard came out of a Buddhist teacher when he said, all suffering is merely a resistance to what is. Wow. All suffering? You mean all of it? And if I don't resist it, I'm not going to suffer. Well, then why the heck am I resisting it? You know, I have a back pain. So maybe if I stretch the back and put a little Vicks Vapor Rub or some deep heat on it and maybe an ice pack and the pain goes away. Well, that wasn't resisting it. That was embracing the very thing uh, that was creating the suffering. So in this month, this describing living in the flow, the first week we talked about a mind that's without fear. And in that, that homily that I gave five weeks ago, I remember recognizing that there is a mind that's fearful. That's our local mind, our egoic mind. And fear is a healthy thing. Fear keeps us safe. You know, when I go into a business, I put a mask on. We were just in Mentone. They have kind of like a, an unspoken language. They don't wear masks up on the mountains because they're hillbillies. So when I went into the little artist studio that carved things out of wood, I was the only masked person in there. And then I found out the man that uh, carves the wood is also a preacher, an evangelical preacher. And he starts talking to me about the devil and hell. And I'm thinking, oh, this is where my dharma gets to meet my karma. Because obviously my karma went in there to buy some sculpted wood, and I'm getting preached about hellfire and brimstone. And, I, and so then I started trying to find that common ground that aren't we all God's children? And I said, you know, when someone comes into my church and I mentioned that there was a trans young woman that came one Sunday who'd been rejected by her family. She moved to a bigger city named Hartzell and they rejected her and she found herself in Huntsville. And when she's standing out there, I said, you've come home. And I put my arms around her and said, you're welcome here. Well, I didn't hear another word from the preacher man. He just, he just nodded his head and realized that maybe if he wanted to make a sale, he needed to stop talking to me. And, <laughs> so I'm the mind that's without fear, you know? They're all our children. Uh, the second week we spoke about the work of being. And what we are are human beings, not human doings. So could we find out who we are being? Are we being open? Are we being loving? Are we being uh, free in our thinking instead of limited in our thinking? Who are you being? You know, are you being part of the solution? Are you being part of the problem? Are you being the protester that's angry? Are you being the protester that's peaceful and loving? You know, by their actions you shall know them, Jesus said, you know. Um, what was it Gandhi said? Uh, my life is my message. It's who I am that I'm trying to project. It's not what I do, it's who I am. So the work of being is the work of being a mensch. I love that Yiddish word. A mensch is just a good human being. And that's the highest compliment you could give somebody. Gigi, you're a mensch. You know, tell a nice German lady that she's a mensch. Sounds crazy. <laughs> you're a mensch. You're just a good human being. Isn't that enough? To be someone who's kind and compassionate, who smiles and helps the least of these. We were driving home from the mountain and the windows were down and all of a sudden in the window comes one of those little inchworms. And he landed on the pug who's lying on my lap. And I'm watching this inchworm scooch up and then open out. And then he scooches up, and he goes from the head of the pug all the way to the tail of the pug. And I thought, what am I going to do with this little inchworm? So I put my finger, and the inchworm was on my finger. And then I put the inchworm in the back seat, and I said, go play with Bert. And that was my way of being. The third week, we talked about the way of being human. And it, this all was inspired by a book called Shifting into Freedom by Locke Kelly, who talks about three phases of life. He says, first you wake up. You wake up to being what you are, then you wake in, that's doing the work to remove the obstacles in our human nature, you know, to clean out our shadow stuff, to embrace our shadow stuff. And then he says you wake out into the world, and that's where you recognize your oneness with everything. So playing with those things, I created this idea of the work of being, the work of being human, and that's where we get to do the work on ourselves.
you know, I was reading Ram Dass's book up there, and I'll give you a little taste of it. And he said, we're not here to change anybody in the world. We're here to be a loving presence. And when we're being a loving presence, they may change or they may not, but they have us as the example of that loving presence. And he says the most insane thing is to think you're here to change the other. Um, people ask me about my sister-in-law, Susan, up in uh, upstate New York, the one who has the cancer of the tongue. And her well-meaning brother, my husband, and her sister are in their very loving family sort of way trying to get her to do what they call the right thing. But she's stubborn because she's a stoddard through and through. They're Scottish. And when they tell her to do things, she rolls her eyes and says, you know, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. And they wanted her to move her bed downstairs because they were afraid she might fall because she's very frail. But she doesn't want to go downstairs. She wants to stay in her bedroom because that's where all her books are. She has a little air conditioner up there. So she and her old dog, Henry, spend all their time in the bed upstairs. And then everybody's concerned for Henry. What about Henry? Poor Henry. I said, Henry's got his job. His karma is to take care of, his dharma is to take care of Susan. So could we not be the judge of that, but have a compassionate understanding that this is her way of coping. And I learned from a hospice nurse years ago when during the AIDS crisis, when I was so concerned about doing the right thing, she says, honor their process, whatever their process is. And then ask, how can I serve? Not how can I fix you, not how can I help you, but how can I serve you? You know, and that's, that's that work of being human, to be very human. And, uh, you know, I shared with you, I loaned some money to, well, I gave some money to the neighbor lady downstairs, and a dear friend also did too. And I saw her yesterday, and she wrote me a thank you note. And I shared with her this other friend who also cared about her enough. And she was so touched. And, you know, doing something simple like helping your neighbor means so much. When the world would just say, you know, you can't pay your rent, you're out of here. No, we've got to shift the way. The work of being human is to be immense, to be compassionate, in my book. And last week I talked about the way of love and what we are as love. It was Teilhard de Chardin that says, someday we will capture the power of love on this universal plane. And for the second time in the world, we will have created fire. So what if love is the fire of the universe? And that we are not the lover, we are not the loved, but we are the loving itself. And that makes it so much bigger. There's the Trinity again, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We want to project love onto form and think the form is my love. But ultimately what you realize is the form is there to awaken the love within you. And when the form leaves, the love doesn't go anywhere. You know, I have such a love affair with my four-legged children. And maybe it's because I don't have the two-legged. I would love to have some two-leggeds, but um, I guess you guys are my two-legged kids. Um, but even when they pass, and they do pass because we're mortal, um, but the love is still there. And it's so comforting to know that the love is still there. I was reading Ram Dass's book, Polish, Polishing the Mirror of the Heart, and he talked about when his guru, Maharaji, died. He said, I was bereft. You know, don't leave me, don't leave me. And then he heard Maharaji's voice, where would I go? And he said, he's with me all the time. He said, I feel him in my heart. So what if we're, in this work of love, we're here to recognize the love that never was born and never dies. And then life can be so, so incredibly sweet. When my mother made her transition, Wanda Gail Campbell said to me, we were sitting right in the front row, she says, you won't understand this now, but maybe you will someday. She says, you'll be closer to your mother in death than you ever were in life. And I thought that was the strangest thing to tell someone whose mother had just had a massive heart attack. And yet, he's right, she's right. She's always there reminding me to touch the moment with compassion, because that was her job. She would say, Scotty, people are touched to pride. Now with the coronavirus, I'm still going to bump your elbows, maybe pat you on the back. And uh, when I can't embrace you, you know, we need to embrace one another. So this week we're going to talk about resting in the journey, the journey that never ends, this journey of life, this flow of life, resting in the journey. And you know, we have a culture that wants a destination. We want to achieve something. And so we are doing is to get something. I was thinking of the Wizard of Oz and those wonderful, that wonderful myth of those characters that wanted, you know, the Tin Man wanted a heart and the Scarecrow wanted a brain and the Lion wanted courage and she wanted to go home. And then they come to the end of the journey, the journey again, and they came to realize that the very things they wanted they already had. And my, I think my most touching moment was when Dorothy was leaving and the Tin Man started to cry. And she says, don't cry, you'll rest yourself up again. And he said to her, now I know I have a heart because it's breaking. That doesn't take a broken heart to realize that you have a heart. So what if uh, we get to shift the way we perceive all of this? 
the very thing you're looking for, you're looking with. And uh, Richard Rohr in his lovely little book, just this. The difference between a guru and a teacher, Ram Dass says, is that a teacher is pointing the way, giving you strategies, but a guru is someone who has embodied it, and their very example is what is teaching you. And I aspire to be that for myself and for others. And certain people have that guru quality, and he's one of them. And here's what he talks about in this book about cultivating your heart attention. He says there's an inner region within all of us, and you know the spiritual heart is on the right side. You can say the physical heart's on the left. So he's inviting you to have this experience with this inner something. And if you've ever had a broken heart, you know you've got a heart. So this inner region, often called the heart, where we have to yield in order to experience any further depths. Learning best happens when calmness and inner safety rule. Then with practice, sometimes taking years to develop, sometimes occurring right away, we can find our way into this heart presence even in the midst of great turbulence. Now I'm using this because I think for all of us at this time on the planet, we need to find that still inner place with this turbulence that's going on all around us. And don't pretend that you don't know it's out there. It is. And so we're not here to fight the turbulence. We're here to find the inner peace. We're here to find that heart space. And he goes on to say this, when we fully enter the silence, we can place our attention at the center of our heart. That's why I start our services out on Sunday mornings by accessing that deep peace, that silence. And then we can listen from that heart space. You know, it's not we're listening from here, we're listening from here. And then we can discover something that's already there. So he goes on to say, this does not mean that we are thinking about our physical heart at all. Let's use a less, and he says, you can do the same with your heart. Know from your heart, not about your heart. And then place your attention there and observe and notice and sense the qualities of this heart space. You will know you have entered it because it will feel as if you are within a vast spherical space where you cannot find a boundary or an ending to this love. It is a feeling of both intimate infinity and infinite intimacy. Oh, I love it when they play with words. Infinite intimacy and intimate infinity. You feel encompassed, you feel held, you feel embraced, and you find that you are within the heart rather than the heart being inside you. You're within the heart. His last little thing is, and when you feel this expansive warmth, you can let it resonate through your body until in perfect calm comes. And you can feel the inherent, always present blessing returning again and again, and it never really goes away from you. The only time sometimes you go away from it. Huh. So this love is always there, waiting for us to put our attention on it. It never goes anywhere. And sometimes, you know, when I study with the Sufis, they would do what they call the heart meditation. And they would say, this is their simple form of meditation, think of someone you dearly love. That's, in my case, it would be Baby Speck. And um, just see them in your mind's eye. And then let that image dissolve, and then just feel the love that never went anywhere. It's that simple. So could we let our practice be to establish in a flow of this essence self that by its very nature creates calmness and harmony and balance. We're not trying to change the world. We're just radiating what we are in the world. And that's this fashioning factor that changes everything. Huh. The journey. When I think of a journey, I think of the Hopi prophecy, which I heard many, many years ago. I took a retreat with Luella Van Lee called The Lover and the Beloved. And at the very end of that spiritual retreat, it's to discover that we are both the lover, we're both the form, and we're the beloved, we're both the essence. So human and divine come together, lover and beloved. And that comes in many forms. So when we project this love out, and that's, that's our lover, and then we recognize that it's the beloved and that it's everywhere. And they closed this whole retreat by talking about the Hopi prophecy. And the Hopi said that we are in a river, it's called the river of life, and it's flowing forward. You can feel it on the planet right now. And they said, observe who's in the river with you, y'all. And they said, it's important that we keep our head above water and that we keep our view forward. Huh, we're moving forward. Notice who's on the sidelines, notice who's in the river with you, this river, this, this emerging evolution. And then he said, at this stage of our evolution, we cannot afford to take anything personally. It's only the ego that takes things personally, right? And he says, because you are the ones that we've been waiting for. So what if we don't need to be afraid that this is our destiny, to be here at this time in history? 
to be the fashioning factor of the homo universalis, the universal human, that's come to evolve and to be lifting humanity up by our example. It was Ram Dass said that you're no longer the star in your movie, which was what so many people think they are, that you build a bigger star and a more famous sense of me. He says, but rather you're a player in the divine drama of life. We're all playing our role to help one another, to serve one another. I'm going to give you a little tiny taste of Ram Dass's uh, beautiful consciousness in polishing the mirror of the heart. I loved reading this when I was up on the mountain because I felt the transmission coming right through his words. And he says this, um, um, Send the light of love and peace out to people who are ill, who are lonely, who are afraid, who have lost their way. You know, his first book was called Be Here Now when he came back from India. And his last book was called Be Love Now. So instead of just being here as Ram Das, what if we could evolve to the very presence of love itself and be love now, and then let the love that we are, we all are, radiate out into the world. And here's how he used his wonderful little metaphor. Share your blessings, because only when you give can you continue to receive. They're the two sides of the same thing. You know, the, the Beatles wrote a song called The Love You Take is the Love You Make. So as, you, as you're expressing love, that's what you get to reap. It's what you sow. Sharing your blessings, because only when you give can you continue to receive. And as you journey on this spiritual path, accept the responsibility for sharing what you receive. So he said, and this is so true, there's a, there's a rule in Inca spirituality. It's the only spiritual rule they have. I love it when there's only one rule. And the rule of Inca spirituality is if you've been blessed, if you've been expanded by life, then you owe it to give back. You've been blessed, I've been blessed, now we get to give back. We get to serve in a higher way. So he's saying the same thing. And he said, I have been blessed more than any man that I know on this planet. And he said, through the grace of God, I've been able to offer that back. He's written, I don't know how many books. He's read how many things. He's served, he's helped children with blindness. And, and his, his guru left him with one admonition, to love, to serve, and remember. To love everyone with equanimity, I don't care who they are, to serve them at the deepest level while honoring their journey, and then to remember that we're all connected, that we're not separate, and to live from that simple little mantra, to love, serve, and remember. And so he says, let that radiant, perfect being within you again assume its diminutive form. He likes to imagine that it's the size of a thumb and it's sitting on the lotus of his heart, this radiant lover that is his true nature. Radha has wonderful metaphors. He says, see it again, sitting on the lotus in your spiritual heart, in the middle of your chest. It's radiant with light, it's peaceful, and it's immensely compassionate. And this being is love itself, and it's within you. This being is wisdom. It's not known for its massive knowledge. He said, I was a Harvard professor. People thought it was my knowledge they wanted, but it was the depth of the wisdom that came from that little light within my heart. And he said, this is your own inner guru. And this is the being within you who always knows, doesn't think, but knows. There's that gnosis again. This is the being you meet through your deeper intuition when you go beyond your mind and its concepts and its ideas and its preferences. This is the tiny form of the entire universe that exists within you. Oh, isn't that delicious to know that the universe exists within you? My teacher used to say, don't put yourself in debt to the world, put yourself in debt to the universe. Wow. And lastly, he says, at any time, you need only sit and quiet your mind, and you will hear this being guiding you home, this being that's within you. When you finish this journey, you will have disappeared into this being. You will be surrendered and merged, and then you will know the truth that Ramana Maharshi spoke about, the great realized being from India, what he meant when he said that God, Guru, and Self are one. God, Guru, and Self are one. The outer Guru takes you to the inner Guru, and the greatest Guru is life. A guru is a dispeller of darkness, a bringer of light. So what is your guru? For me, maybe it's a little dog. Maybe Gene is a butterfly. Maybe then it's a tree. God knows. And then you begin to see the gurus everywhere. Gee, you are you. It's, it's everything. Yeah, and it's transmitting itself. And it's love meaning love. And then when this love awakens, as Ernest Holmes says, this love sees only love. It's falling in love with love. Because it's all love. Now that's the journey. That's resting in the journey of love. And I invite you to inquire within yourself, what's the journey that I'm taking? Am I taking a journey of resistance or bitterness, or am I taking a journey uh, of gratitude and the willingness to see everything is here for me? 
I will announce, well, I'll end pretty soon, we're going to be doing a new class starting on Wednesday, and it's based on a book called Healers on Healing. I brought a copy of the book we have some here at the center. For those of you out in virtual land, this is what the book looks like. And it's Wednesday mornings from 10 to 11.30. And then Gloria G and I on Wednesday nights are doing our satsang. Satsang will be thinking sitting in truth. Sat is truth. And song is from Sangha. So a Sangha is a community that sits in truth. And in this wonderful book, it's an anthology of 39 different presenters. You know, anthology means a bouquet of flowers. And so in the foreword of the book, he said, there's not one right way to talk about healing, but there are patterns that we can align the healing. There's healing through love. And the very first essay is by Bernie Siegel, and he says, love, medicine, and miracles. And he says, the greatest healer is love itself. So his whole treatise is on love. Another section of the book is finding healing through a perception of wholeness, knowing that when we perceive the wholeness that's inherent within us, we're actually calling that wholeness forth. And so again and again throughout this book, they inspire us by catching the hints, catching the threads of truth. And he says these golden threads of truth are out there in its multiplicity, but it's our job to be the discerning one that says, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, they're saying the same thing. And so I just want to give you a tiny taste of Rachel Naomi Raymond's, a mystic doctor from the San Francisco area, and how she talks about healing. And this is what I believe we really truly need on our planet right now. She says, healing is natural. It's the most natural thing. We've got to stop thinking of it as abnormal. Disease isn't normal. Health is normal. Disease, she says, healing is natural. It's not magical. It's not mystical. It doesn't require some esoteric intervention. Rather, it's your birthright and it's mine. And everybody has the capacity for deep healing. She said, we do this with each other all the time and we don't even know it. Just by being in the presence of someone who is loving and peaceful, is contagious. We contagion each other with our health, with our sense of wholeness. So she says, healing is the very ground of being. Everything is moving toward this wholeness. And that's all healing is, is merely that movement, that flow toward that wholeness. And our task is not to make something happen, but to uncover what is already happening in us and in others. And when we do, we contagion each other. She says, and to recognize and foster those conditions that nurture it, that's all. Foster the conditions that nurture your healing, your perception of wholeness. We can do that with ritual, we can do it with prayer, or with many different approaches and techniques. We can simply sit and be together, like we do in class here in the sanctuary, and think about our true nature together. No one technique is inherently any better than any other. It's simply a matter of learning to trust the natural healing process in all of us and moving freely with it. To trust this natural healing process within you. How does it feel? You know? As a little boy, I had a teddy bear. I think he was a koala bear. And I would hug him. And when I'd hug that little teddy bear, I'd feel better about myself. So did I have teddy bear healing? Maybe I did. I still have him in my room, that little bear. And I look at him and I smile at him. Because when I hold him, I feel loved. Huh. Whatever works for you. And lastly, she says, I, for one, am rather taken aback with talk of certain people being healers. In my opinion, this just separates people from the naturalness of their own healing capacity. And that's the magical thing. The ordinariness. Because the ordinary is truly the most extraordinary thing of all. So I'm not going to throw away my teddy bear. The ordinary is the most extraordinary thing of all. You know, there's, some, there's a lot of death on the planet, and um, death is a part of life. And I, every time I pass by um, my little kitty cat's grave, I think how she was the guru who helped me see the beauty of death. You know, Trey's sister's making her transition, Gigi's sister's making her transition. Susan stopped eating. Smudge stopped eating. And I remember, rather than me try to force her to eat, I tried everything. Clam juice, tuna juice, she loved all the, 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 all the fishy things. And as much as I wanted her to linger, she basically said, I'm ready to go. But she wasn't suffering. And so then I went online and I said, how can I hospice my little kitty cat into a peaceful, loving death? And they said they love quiet. And so I honored her in her little journey as she staggered. She was so thin, I think she was down to three pounds. And she went out and she lay by the pond on the cool stone and she heard the water, the fountain. And that was one of her places. Then she staggered up the steps and she went under the bed. And then finally, she went from under the bed over to baby Speck's bed. 
And everybody knew that was her bed. We left it kind of like an altar. And she lay right in the middle of her bed. And she was so fragile at the stage. And I went over and I lay down next to her. And I'm stroking her little neck. And it took so much energy for her to lift her neck. And she just purred. And let me know that she was acknowledging that. And then she just gave up the ghost right there. How beautiful. What a sacred time. And she was my teacher. She was my guru. Showing me how it's done. You know, and... So what if we could open to that beautiful healing presence, what's right now, and know that the teacher is everywhere, the guru is everywhere. They're dispellers of darkness and bringers of light. They open our heart. Sometimes it feels like it's broken, but a broken heart is an open heart. And so we rest in that open-hearted awareness, and we find ourselves on this journey in life resting in this journey of our own unfoldment, like a flowering, something flowering within our hearts, within our minds. Let's call it truth, it's flowering. A truth that goes beyond concept and belief, but a truth that has meaning. A truth that is incontrovertible, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said. The greatest truths that I know are that there's only one life, and that life is unfolding in all creation. It's flowing through all creation. And so as I step out of the role of star in my own life, I can recognize that I am a, a wave of energy in this divine life. I am an idea in the mind of God that is flowering as a David person. David is the impermanent aspect of this life and yet a significant one, because David is in service to that one life, that one life that we all share. And I invite us to be stewards of that life, to be in service to that life, to serve the one in the many, and serve the many in the one. It's all the same. And so when life shows us maybe our obstacle, we can smile at it and thank them. Ah, oh, thank you. I no longer need to have that cause to my experience, but I can give thanks for it, for the recognition of it. And then let it go, let it be, and surrender once again into this flow of breath, into this flow of love, into that open-hearted awareness that is by its very nature is free, it's not bound by a history or herstory. Huh. And when the story falls away, that life is still there. There is but one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. And that life is my life now. There's only one life. Say that silent with me. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. And that life is my life now. And from that place of deep honoring, of the life that we all share, the sacred life that we all share, I invite you to put your hands over your heart chakra and say the heart salutation to the one that knows no other by saying, I honor you. I respect you. I love you. You are the deepest aspect of myself. This beloved in me honors the beloved in you. In this sacred place, we are one. Mm. Feel that. Feel that sense of connectedness, that intimacy, that infinite intimacy, and that intimate infinity as you. And when you're ready, open your heart, open your hands, open your eyes, and let your light so shine as you radiate it out into the world. Know that you matter, that you're important, that you're the way it works. We need you. As that Marie reminds me, we're in this together and we'll get through this as bright lights shining in the world. Oh, and thank you all for sending in your ties to the center. It means a lot. See you next week.